hey, um, Hope City Church family, I, I just can't tell you how much I love this church family, how much I love you guys. It, uh, yesterday, we had an amazing time at the Art of Marriage Conference. Those of you who were able to attend, I see some of you aren't here that attended yesterday. That's a good thing. <laughs> Praise the Lord. That means you, you stayed wherever you were at. Praise Him. And um, um, for those of you who came back today, I'm glad you're here. It was an awesome time. It won't be the last one we do. Just to kind of cue you up, uh, Todd and Joni McNamara, most of you know Todd and Joni. Todd was the worship leader. Joni's the shorter blonde with glasses. Um, they're going to be launching a marriage ministry here at our church family. It'll be an eight-week um, time to, to go through some of the content we went through yesterday and grow stronger marriages just to kind of be aware of that. I'm excited today um, because we're talking about family, probably one of my favorite subjects to talk about. I'm a part of a family. I think one of the reasons why this subject means so much to me, it's because I came from a broken family, and so um, I saw it done wrong really well. And um, by God's grace, um, I'm learning to, to get it right. I've not always got it right, but I'm, I am learning to get it right. And so I'm excited about this subject. Will you all pray with me for this service that the Lord would teach us all how to have strong families, not just naturally, but even spiritually? Will you guys do that with me? Father, we thank you today that you love us. God, we thank you that you love families and that you um, have made us a part of a family, a spiritual family, God, even. Um, I just think of some of us who have been adopted into families, God, that um, I can just think of some of the men and women um, who are like moms and dads to me and Angela, uh, who they, they didn't birth us, but they've become our family. And so, Lord, today, would you give us your word, your truth, your heart for family. Lord, as we read your word, we love you, Jesus. Help us to be stronger. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Amen. Well, I am, uh, like I said just a few minutes ago, I'm really excited about today's message, Stronger. Over the last four weeks, today's week four, we've got one more week in this series. We've been looking at that subject of stronger and how do we have stronger relationships and how do we have stronger marriages and then how do we grow stronger families. And so even this week as I was preparing, I really felt the Holy Spirit prompting me and reminding me and saying, Kovadis, now this subject of family and my heart for family, my desire for families to be strong, to flourish, and to be fruitful, it doesn't just apply to families that have a mom and a dad. I want every family to be strong, and that reminded me of my own childhood and being in a single parent home. God had a plan. If you're in the room today and you're a single mom or a single dad, God bless you and thank you for holding the line when you could have given up, because I'm the product of a single parent home. As a matter of fact, I'm not just a product of a single parent home, but I'm the product of a woman who, who's married three times, divorced twice, and died in the middle of her third marriage. And so don't tell me that my past or my upbringing determines my future because it doesn't. Jesus does, okay? And, but the truth is, is that, that by Jesus' help, us as parents, those of us who are natural parents, we can create a home environment that grows strong children. I'm confident of that because that's what God's Word says. But I just wanted to kind of just say, hey, this is what we're talking about today. This applies to blended families, adopted families, intact families, broken families, families that fight fair and families that fight unfair. This applies to spiritual families. So I don't want anyone in the room to say, well, I'm not married, I'm single, or I'm divorced, or I'm widowed, or I'm alone and single and doing this on my own. Listen to me, beloved, this applies to you. This, what we're going to learn today, applies to you. So you find yourself in this. If you're not married, think about your spiritual family. And if you're a single parent, know that God has promises for you. That God's not left you. He's not forsaking you. He will see you through. I've said it before. I'll say it again. If God brought you to it, he'll bring you through it. That's a promise. That is a promise. If God has brought you this far, he will carry you all the way. That is a promise. He will never leave. He will never forsake. We can hang our hat on that, and our hearts can rest secure in that truth. Okay? 
Today we're going to do that and learn how to grow flourishing families, fruitful families, stronger families, whatever kind of family you have by looking at Psalms 128. And so if you have a Bible, you can kind of turn there and, and get ready to jump in. If not, no worries, it'll be on the screen for you. What we're going to do is look through Psalm 128 verse by verse. And so we're going to do some expository teaching here. We're going to go verse by verse. I believe the Word of God is sufficient to strengthen us, establish us, and solidify us and our families to grow fruitful and flourishing in all that He has for us. And so we're going to go to the Word today as a spiritual family. We're going to ask some tough questions, talk about some hard things, but we're going to grow stronger and better as a result of it today. Okay? Is that okay? Okay, you guys with me? Yeah? Okay. Well, let's just jump right on in. Psalms 128, starting at verse 1. Here's what's happening. Verse 1 says this, Blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in his ways. You shall eat the fruit of the labor of your hands. You shall be satisfied, and it shall be well with you. Your wife will be like a fruitful vine within your house. Your children will be like olive shoots around your table. Behold, thus shall the man be blessed who fears the Lord. The Lord bless you from Zion. May you see the prosperity of Jerusalem all the days of your life. May you see your children's children. May you see God's peace upon Israel. In the Psalms, we, the, the psalmist is called a song of ascent, which meant that this psalm, there's 150 of them about in the middle of your Bible. So there's 150 psalms, which were songs and poetry that the children of Israel would sing. A lot of them were written by David, who was a king in Israel. Many of us would know that, but there are certain psalms for certain occasions, like there's certain songs for certain occasions. At Christmas time, you don't sing wedding songs, and right? And during New Year's, you don't sing Christmas songs. The, the celebration determines the song you sing. Psalms 128 is, is like that. Psalms 128 is called a song of ascent. Pastor Q, what does that mean? Well, the children of Israel would um, pilgrimage every year, at least once a year, for a celebration. Most of the time, twice a year, but for sure at least once a year, they would all pilgrimage to the capital city of Jerusalem. So think Israel right now. That's in the news a lot. The six-point star thing, the Jewish people there. That's who we're talking about. They would go to the capital city of Jerusalem. Well, they didn't have planes, trains, or automobiles, so they walked right? And so when they would walk on their way to Jerusalem, depending on how far away you live, to pass the time, they would sing. And this would be one of the songs that they would sing. You, you got to imagine that it's kind of like the wild, wild west. Not all roadways or highways are, are safe. And so very rarely would just one guy and one gal travel together Never would just a single gal travel, and so they would travel in herds and caravans of families. So you can imagine maybe even a group of around this size would travel from their hometown of Galilee all the way down to the big city of Jerusalem, and they would sing songs as children ran through their legs and was on their papa's back and as newlyweds held their hands, and they would sing this song together. Blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in his ways. Our children will be like olive branches around our table. Our wives will be fruitful vines. Blessed will be the labor of your hands. Blessed you will be because the Lord your God will be with you. And may you see God's blessing on Jerusalem. What does that mean? How does that apply to us today? I love this psalm as we talk about having stronger families and whether they're spiritual or what have you. Because the first thing we come into contact with is this, verse 1, bless it. Bless it. 
The idea is that God loves to bless his people. He's a generous God. He's a gracious God. He's a kind God. God is for you, not against you. God desires to bless you. Yes, you. You can say every morning, Father, thank you that you desire to bless me, that you're for me and not against me. And if you're for me, what can man do to me? Every morning you can wake up with the confidence, look to heaven and say, Father, thank you that you love me and that you desire to bless me. The blessing of God, though, is an interesting thing. See, God's blessing usually falls in one of three categories, and this will be helpful for for many of us to think about this a little bit. So God's blessing first is present, and that's usually what we think of when we think of God's blessing, like God bless me now. Like, I don't, not later, like, like now, Lord, I want a blessing. Like, Lord, I need you to bless me. I need more money. I want to get along better with my wife. My boyfriend's mean. My boss is a jerk. My kids are driving me crazy. God, stop them. Stop their hearts for, just for 10 minutes. Bring them back. I just need a breather. <laughs> Thank you, all right? The blessing is the present. That's not the only way God blesses his people. See, God also blesses his people in the future. Here's the idea, family, can I tell you something because I love you, some of you? Uh, Here's the big idea. Some of the blessings and promises of God you will not receive until you see him face to face. That's good and that's okay. In a word of instant gratification, our God is committed to the process, not just the prize. Did you catch that? He's committed to the process of forming and shaping you into the image of his son, not just the benefit of being in relationship with him, instant blessing and gratification. He is not Buddha. He is not something you rub a little bit like a genie. He's not a gumball machine, put a quarter in, get a bubble gum out. He's God, and he knows, and he's good. And I love what Jesus' little brother James says. And here's what Jesus' baby brother said. He says, every good and every perfect gift. Say that, every good, every perfect gift comes from the Father. Father. Here's the big idea, family. Think about this. If that's true what you just said, then if you don't have it and you've been asking for it, that means it's either not good or it's not perfect. So then what you can do is give God the grace to let him lead you and you not lead him and tell him what you need and what you want and allow him to bring blessing into your life. Does that make sense? So God's blessing is present, it's future, but here's the third one, the the thing we got to get and remember, sometimes God's blessing is spiritual. Like how do you measure in the bank account waking up sane after all the bad things you went through in life? You can't measure that or still believing in love in spite of the fact that you've been hurt or the car crash you didn't get in at the time you could have died in that moment of stupidity and foolishness as a teenager. You made it through and you're still here today. Like how do you measure that in a bank account or, or in abundance externally? You can't. So spiritually you go, God, I thank you, I bless you, and I love you that you're doing far more than what you know. And I'm convinced that the day that I see Jesus, there's going to be a whole football team of angels that say, boy, you are a hard one. (laughs) Boy, you had us working. (laughs) Our Father's good. But here's the thing. The benefit of God's blessing is not earned. You need to understand that. You cannot earn God's blessing. What do you mean? God blesses you because he's good, not because you are. But the bounty of the blessing is dependent upon your participation and partnership with him through love and obedience. Think through that. So the blessing of God is not earned because he blesses you because that's who he is. God is love. He was loved before you were ever created. As a matter of fact, the Bible says that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. Okay? So you don't earn his blessing, but the bounty, the abundance of the blessing, it is dependent upon your participation and partnership with him in love and obedience. What that means is the blessing will come how much comes, it's dependent upon you. I'm going to feed my kids every night, but whether they get steak and lobster or whether they get macaroni and cheese is dependent upon their behavior. (laughs) They're going to eat either way. (laughs) They're going to eat because they're mine. But the quality of the meal is dependent upon their love and obedience to me as a parent, right? That's just good parenting. We're just saying he's a good, good father. Does that make sense? 
So what does that mean then? Because the psalmist says this, going back to the text, blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in his ways. Did you catch that? He attaches behavior and emotion to the blessing. He says, blessed is everyone who fears the Lord. Blessed is everyone who fears the Lord. Say that. Blessed is everyone who fears the Lord and who walks in his ways. So then the blessing is connected and it's conditional. The abundance of the blessing is connected to a condition. The condition is this. Do you fear him and do you walk in his way? See, here's the big idea. Being a follower of Jesus, if that's you in this room, listen to me. I love you. Hear me clearly. Being a disciple of Jesus is both emotional and it's practical. Okay? In most cultures, depending on your context, if this was black folks in the black church, It'd be real emotional. Black folks love God. They just love to tell God how much they love them. You ain't ever got to worry about them yelling and screaming and telling God how much they love them. You ain't ever got. And white folks from the South do it really well. Somebody say amen. amen. I'm thinking about you, brother. I'm thinking about you. White people tend to, this is a massive generalization. Can I do this as your pastor? Can I just talk about being black and white? Is that okay? Can we just, can we do that? Okay, I'm doing it anyway. I got the microphone. You can't stop me. <clears throat> Typically, so, so here, here's the fancy way of saying it. Black folks tend to be more intuitively based in, in learning and in, in, in interaction. White folks tend to be more cognitive and practical, pragmatic in their thinking. Why? I don't know. That's just been my limited experience. Again, massive generalization. I know that's not true for everybody. Okay, so just don't, don't send me any emails. <laughs> don't, don't send me no follow-up emails. Here's the point that I'm making, though. Is that what the reason I'm bringing that up? Because we have a mixed congregation with blacks and whites. And so, for my white brothers and sisters, I would say during praise and worship, it's okay to yell, scream, dance, and clap. That's good. Because <laughs> there you go. Hallelujah. Breakthrough. <laughs> Revival's coming. Because here's the thing here's what the disciple is. Here's how I define the disciple. If you want to know Q, what is a disciple? Like, what does the disciple say, do? How do they live? Here's what I say a disciple is a disciple is someone who is learning to love and live for Jesus and teaching others to do the same in the everyday stuff of life. A disciple, a follower of Jesus, is someone who is learning. They haven't arrived, we're in pursuit. None of us are perfect, no perfect people allowed in this church. We're all learning, including the pastor. A disciple, a follower of Jesus is someone who's learning. It's a process. We're learning to love Jesus. That's emotional. I don't want to just obey him. I want to love him with my whole heart. I want to weep when I hear his name. I want to sing his praises when I feel happy. When I feel sad, I want to snuggle up on the couch, grab my Bible, and tell Jesus I need him. I want to feel Jesus, not just know Jesus intellectually. A follower of Jesus loves him. Love him, loves him, but also obeys him. It says, blessed everyone who fears the Lord. That idea of fear isn't fear of punishment and, oh, no, he's going to crush me. There are times in unbelievers, here's the thing. If you're in the room today and you don't know Jesus, here's the reality. God knows that he's God even if you don't. Okay? And God knows that he has established what's right and what's wrong, and you don't get to vote. He has established righteousness and unrighteousness, and I'm loving you enough to tell you that there is a day that that father also sits on the throne and in the courtroom as a judge, and all of us will be judged according to the deeds that we have done. And if we don't have Jesus Christ to stand up like a defender and say, but that one right there, I died for their sins, I paid the penalty, and they are no longer guilty because I am found guilty, Father. I was rejected so that they could be accepted. If you don't have Jesus, my friend, I love you, but there is a reason for you to be afraid. Very much so there's a reason for you to be afraid. That is the God of the Bible. I do not care what culture has told you. I don't care what the latest book you read told you, the latest preacher you said told you. God is a judge, and he will judge the living and the dead. He is so much so a judge that he judged his only son so that he could save you. Think through that for a second. But this isn't the kind of fear he's talking about. When he says, blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, the word, I looked it up, it means to be awestruck. 
It says, blessed is everyone who's struck with awe when they think about him. They go, oh, you made everything? Like, like everything, everything goes, I made it all. As a matter of fact, the Bible says that he took the, he took the, the cosmos and he measured them in the span of his hand. All of the galaxies, God said. That's about right. <laughs> that do. Bang. And everything fell in place. Fear or being awestruck is the gateway to worship, which leads you into love. Oh, you're glorious. You're amazing. I worship you. You're bigger than me. You're greater than me. You're mightier than me. You're God, and I'm the man, and I'm okay with the difference. I give you all of my love, affection, and attention. He says, blessed is everyone who has that posture of heart when they think about God. He goes, not only that, he says, but blessed is everyone who walks in his way. See, the bounty of God's blessing is found as we give our hearts and our lives to Jesus Christ in humble submission and surrender. The idea of walking, I was thinking about that, this idea of blesses everyone who walks in your ways. And I'm a, I'm a dad, and so I'm thinking about it like a dad, and I'm going, man, I'm thinking about my, my boy and my, my daughter, and they weren't born running, praise God, right? I had a moment where I could just set them in their car seat and go have coffee and eat and come back, and it was okay. I was glad that I didn't have to hold them all the time. I could just put them in a little bouncy thing. And the point is this. If you're a Christian in the room, we all start off as spiritual babies. None of us start out walking in the way of God. We start out crawling. See, if you're a Christian, then you, you crawl before you walk and you walk before you run. And so here's the idea because we got a race that's set before us that we're all called to run. Well, what he's saying is this. Walking in the way of God's word, God's blessing is... You don't walk alone. You walk with Jesus. It's a relationship. It's a conversation. Think about Blake and Nicole. You guys are walking and doing life together, and she's telling you her dreams and her fears and her passions, her desires, and you're doing the same, and it's a relationship. That's how God releases his blessing on the family. It's through us having a relationship with him. There's four areas of blessing that the psalmist describes that we can look forward to having as a family. We're going to look at those together. Let's, let's jump back up to verse number, um, number two. Back up. First, he goes to the head of the house, the, the, the leader. Now, verse one says, this blessing is for everyone who fears the Lord. You're going to read a little bit, and you're going to see that, that everyone is true, men, women. The blessing is for you, for sure. Moms, dads, singles, marries, divorced, widowed, whatever phase of life you're in, the blessing is for you, but specifically, contextually, the text the Bible verses, it's talking about a male. We know that because we're going to read it here in a few minutes. So the four areas of blessing first to the man, he says, this or to the leader of the house, really. You shall be blessed because, verse 2, you shall eat the fruit of the labor of your hands. You shall be blessed and it will be well with you. One of the things the Lord's been teaching me here, here lately is is. This idea, the season that you sow in or you plant isn't the same season that you reap. I plant crops in spring and I reap in fall. The, the labor of the hands, really what he's talking about is this, this idea. There's this process that we all go through today. You might go, I'm, I'm, I'm going to church queue. Stuff is still hard. She don't see that I'm changing. My kids still remember who I used to be or my kids aren't getting better. It's not changing. I go, you're sowing. You're sowing. You're sowing. You're sowing. You're looking to be reaping when really you're sowing. Get the season right. Get the season right. It'll keep you from being discouraged. So here's what I believe he, a practical way to think through that. He says, you shall, verse 2, you shall, shall is a definitive statement. It's a statement of confidence. The idea is that you shall eat. If you walk in God's way, if you love God's word, if you love God's people, you shall eat. There is a process, but you can be confident that God will be faithful. Some of you are coming back to church or some of you are in church for the first time. Beloved, please. Stick with it. Stick with it. If you're going to put your eggs in any basket, if you're going to invest in any area of your life, stick 
with it. I promise you, I am a satisfied customer. It works. What doesn't work is life gets better and there aren't any hiccups or hangups. But what does get better is that I am not alone. Jesus Christ is with me. He is overcome. Therefore, I will overcome. My faith will conquer all that stands in my way. And with God's help, with God's grace, with this family behind me, I will overcome. I promise you, you will overcome if you stay in the race. Just stay in the race. I promise you, you will overcome. He, God is not a man that he should lie. And God said, you shall eat the fruit of your labor. Keep sowing. Just imagine yourself like Johnny Appleseed. Just keep sowing. Just keep sowing. Just keep sowing. I promise you, there will come a harvest of righteousness, whether now or later. There, God is not a man that he should lie. And he said, you shall eat the fruit of your hands. Here's the other idea behind it, though. The principle works both ways. If you spent a lot of years sowing bad seed, it's going to take a little while for that plant and that harvest to die out. So you've got to be patient in the process. Okay? Okay. Here's four things you can ponder or think through to see a harvest. One, there's this thing that you do. You got to prepare. Before you can see a harvest, if you're going to sow seeds, you got to, one, you got to prepare. So prepare the soil. Prepare your heart. Two, it's plan. I remember when I first got saved, Angela wasn't saved. I had a plan in my heart that I was not going to be the man that I used to be. And so one of those things was I wouldn't talk to any other girl just because I didn't want her to ever feel insecure about the way I felt about her. I had a plan what I wanted to teach my kids. And so I studied the Word of God while I was away due to my bad decisions. I had a plan. Point three is you got to plan. At some point, you got to plant the seed. You can't keep it quiet close to yourself. You got you to gotta plant the seed and you got to build in the relationship. You got to make time for the other person. You got to invest in them. Just this morning during worship, the Lord convicted me and said, Covatis, don't you ever forget your wife is your first ministry. Because see, I sometimes have competing passions. And if I don't know if I'm the only one in the room that's ever had something rival for my wife's affections, and my, my, here's, my, here's my competing passion, it's y'all. I love y'all. I absolutely love this church. I wake up in the morning thinking about this church. I go to bed thinking about this church every day. On my day off. My wife is starting to call my cell phone my other wife. Because I'm always on it. But you spending time with her today. You talk to her more than you talk to me. You touch her more than you touch me. Let the reader understand. <laughs> and the Lord said, Kovatis, don't you forget that your wife is your first ministry. You sow good seed in that soil. I said, yes, sir. I sure will, Dad. Thank you. Not only that, the last one is this. You got to be patient. You got to practice, and then you got to be patient. It just takes time. Well, for the wife, here's what he says, moving through the text, just looking at it as a spiritual family. He says, this is the blessing the guy or the leader of the home can look forward to, to you as a wife or woman in general. I believe this is what we're about to read applies to you. Here's what he says. He goes on verse 3, your wife or a woman, for that matter, will be like a fruitful vine within your house. I had this idea as I was reading through this passage that for me, my wife, I'm thinking through my wife. She's my wife, not your wife or anyone else's wife. I've been given the sole responsibility, honor, and privilege to lead and love her to become more like Jesus. And if I do that well, my wife will flourish and be fruitful in every area of her life. And so this idea of your wife, she would be like a fruitful vine in your house. And the first idea that I'm working through is that at the end of the day, I want to be clear for the wives in the room, it's not your husband's job to be your primary source of security, significance, and satisfaction. It is not your husband's job. He is not Jesus. And if you're looking for him to be Jesus, you're going to continue to be disappointed and discouraged. He is not Jesus. So your fruitfulness isn't solely based on his leadership. That's great news. You know how inconsistent your husband is. <laughs> he woke up today, he loved you. He woke up yesterday, he's irritated. Jesus never does that. He always said, come on, girl, let's talk. But, while that's true, but 
the Lord will use your husband to sow seeds of greatness and even to bring pruning into your life. Husband, the Lord wants to use you or man. If you're not married, think about this young man before you get married. God wants to use you to sow seeds of greatness into whatever woman he brings into your life and to prune the bad branches in her life. What does that mean? That doesn't mean you become the sin police and you look at all of her bad stuff and say, you did this wrong, you did this wrong, you did this wrong. But rather what you do in a loving way, say, honey, I think there's more fruit that can come for your life. And I think this thing is actually sapping your energy, strength, and life source. Let's get rid of that thing because I love you and I want to see you be fruitful. My wife is my wife. She lives in, in my house. Now, here's the big idea. Wives and women, here's the thing. For those of you that are wives or, or that are dating, fellas, listen. Who she is and girl, who you are is the sum total of your experiences and interactions with men before you met your husband or boyfriend. Who you are is the sum total of your interactions. That's a big statement of who you are based on your interactions with men before you met your current spouse or boyfriend or soon-to-be significant other. In other words, we talked about it last week, my words are shaping worlds. And so as a dad, I am shaping the world and the ethos of my daughter, and I'm preparing her to be married. And so her husband is either going to thank me or want to shoot me when he gets her. He's going to want to thank me. Now, he might say, how'd you handle her? Because she's strong. And I'm going to go, she's strong. She's my daughter. That's right. Wave me down, Kayla. She's waving me down in the back. But here's the thing. Her confidence in her countenance is a direct reflection of your leadership in her life. Her countenance in her confidence is a direct reflection of your leadership in her life. Does she smile? Does she laugh? Does she think she can take on the world? See, I'm not responsible for my wife's character. That's the Holy Spirit's job. I'm not even responsible for her contribution to this church. That's the Holy Spirit's job. But her confidence, that's my job. Her countenance, that's my job. Now, I know some of us are in the room going, well, I'm not married. I'm a single woman. Listen to me. The men in this church have become your big brother, and the older men have become fathers to you. That's on us. If you're a single woman in this church, do you smile? I know you do. Where's Chelsea at? There she is. Just the other day, just today, I said, girl, you are so beautiful. I'm a big brother like a papa to her. The women in this church should be confident. I know I can do anything. And as a matter of fact, I've had a couple of you come to me and go, I like this guy, Q, will you vet him? I go, absolutely. <laughs> Tony, we got, we got some work to do. Fellas, we got some work to do. That's our job as men. This applies to no matter what kind of family you're in, whether you're married or you're in a spiritual family. Does that make sense? Y'all with me? See why it's so important to be in a spiritual family? It's mad. You can't understate it. It doesn't end there. The psalmist doesn't end there. He, he continues a little bit, and here's what he says to, to parents. He says, your children will be like olive shoots around your table. They're to grow up around your table. And so my job as a parent, just so you know how we think in the Marshall family, my job as a parent is to connect my children to their heavenly father because I will fail them and fall short. And I want them to be confident and have a, a good communication with their heavenly father. So my job, I'm always trying to push my kids to Jesus. What does Jesus say? What does Jesus want? What does Jesus think? Because I'm going to fail them. I'm going to hurt them. I don't want to but I'm gonna. And I want them to have a strong enough relationship with God that no matter who says what or what happens in their life, they know how to connect with God. The greatest gift I can give my children is the gospel and a good prayer life. If I can teach my kids to love God and his word, if I can teach my kids how to connect with God relationally in a relationship through a conversation, I mean, then I've given my children the greatest gift I could ever give them. I don't know what they're going to enjoy doing. Right now, my son wants to be a football player. Next month, is going to be to be a firefighter. Next month, is going to be a beautician. I mean, I have no clue where this thing's going with that little dude. But I want him confident. I want him confident. He can do anything. 
and that he can talk to his father in heaven, and his father in heaven hears him and knows him and understands him. That's my job. So what, do I, what, what does it mean when he says, your children shall be like olive shoots around your table? Well, well, here's the reality. When I think about my kids, I told y'all I'm a green thumb, black thumb, but green thumb. Um, right? You get me. <laughs> um, here's what I tell my kids. Um, the way I think about raising my kids, he says, your children are like olive shoots that grow up. And so um, I love to garden. I love vine plants. I love watermelons, honeydews, cucumbers. I love vine plants because I like to train them. As a parent, your job is to train your children in the way that they should go. That's our job as parents is to train our children like vine plants. I love them because you, you put them here and then they grow up and then you have to redirect them and put them there. The Bible says in Proverbs 22 verse 6, train your child up in the way that they should go. And when they're older, they won't depart from it. Here's what it means. It doesn't mean control their life. It means direct their life. I'm directing my children in the way that they should go because as a parent, I have the great privilege of learning their likes, their passions, their dislikes, their strengths, their weaknesses. And based on that, I lead and guide them in the way that they should go. They're an olive branch. They're organic. It's growing up. The olive branch isn't connected to the vine. In the context of the scripture, the context is in its own soil. My children are connected to the great vine dresser. We're all branches of that vine. My children are their own individual independent people, and I'm teaching them how to love God and love and submission as they obey me and their mom. The fact that my children grow up around my table, I believe what he's getting to is that our children grow into the soil, or excuse me, our children grow in the soil of our home. Now, I've done it wrong. Many of you know my story. I was away for seven and a half years in prison while my daughter grew up without me. I determined every day, prayed for her consistently, constantly, fasted on her behalf, wrote her letters weekly, studied the Bible vigorously, and pursued her greatly when I first came home. In the first three years, she hated me and let me know she did not hide it. I hate you. I wish you were still in prison and weren't here with me. Right now, when my daughter has a boy that likes her, who does she call first? Me. When my daughter has an issue, when she's struggling, she calls her mom too. I don't want to overstate it. But my daughter and I have a, have a close relationship. Not we're a lot of likes, so we butt heads a lot. <laughs> but we have a great relationship. It's not how you start it. It's how you finish. Here's some habits. Here's what I think. I think that if parents, that we can create healthy habits to help grow strong kids. Here's nine of them that we use. I won't work through all of them, but I'll highlight a couple of them that we enjoy as a family. Should be up on your screen. One of the things that I love to do as, um, as a dad is to maximize my car ride time. Now, I haven't always been good at that, and my daughter brought it to my attention that I wasn't good at that. She says, it's 7 a.m. You're driving me to Starbucks to work, Dad. Why are you texting people? I'm going to ask 20, 15 minutes to get some work done. She goes, when, when we're driving, can you put your phone down? I went, amen. <laughs> that was mama bear talking. So I'm learning to maximize that drive time. Just imagine that drive time, if you could just interact with your kids. For me, the, the second place for me is um, this one right here. It's uh, at bedtime. Um, every night, 90% of the time, it's me that prays with my son before he goes to sleep at night. That's our connect time. Um, I sing to him, I, I, I pray with him, and then I sing to him. Uh, and y'all sat next to me in church. Y'all know I can't sing. I couldn't sing to save my life. But my son's hearing his daddy praise Jesus. So it won't be so hard for him to sing on Sunday morning. For some of us guys, it's hard to sing on Sunday morning to have other guys hear our voice. My son won't have that problem. Because he's learning at a young age that it's good to sing because he heard his daddy sing and he's got a horrible voice. <laughs> For a little while, one of the things we did as a family, we had a family meeting on Saturday where we would talk about the week in life. There's a list. Figure out which ones connect with you the most. Todd, come on up. I'm going to transition this. We're just about done here. Verse 5 and 6. Here's the big idea, Hope City Church. God wants to bless your family. So there's the blessing of God on your family, on us as a spiritual family even. And then there's also the blessing that God wants to release through your family. That makes sense? God wants to bless us, and then he wants to release his blessing through us. We are blessed to be a blessing. 
Say that with me. We are blessed to be a blessing. Isn't that amazing? We are blessed to be a blessing. Here's what the psalmist says in the passage. Verse 5, the Lord bless you from Zion. May you see the prosperity of Jerusalem all the days of your life. May your children's children, may you see your children's children. Peace be upon Israel. Now, in the text, that idea of blessing, um, for them, the general sense is God bless the city that we're going to. God wants to bless this city through this church. I love that we are an externally facing church. Like, I love that we are always thinking about how can we be a blessing to this community? What, what avenues and what doors is God going to open for us to take the good news of Jesus where we can see people smile and we can see people get connected with God and we can see marriages restored and we can see addictions get broken. I love that about us, that we as a church, we're in this city, of the city, and we are for this city. That's what we're for. Our missional community just had a chance last week to go to Carver and feed the teachers as they were working hard during conferences. And then this Monday, Dustin's missional community is going to Carver to serve food during the Black History Month. And Tracy and, and um, Mark's missional community have been going to the House of Hope. And Annie and Josiah's missional community is just getting taken off. And there's going to be more missional communities started. And as a church family, this summer, we're going to do all church blitz. Every last one of us, we're going to go serve this city. I love that. But he doesn't end there. He goes, may you see your children's children. See, I I don't want this church to grow old with me. I don't want to be 40 years in and this church be filled with folks that are in their 60s with me. I want 60-year-olds in the room because I'm going to be 60 one day. And I want the 60-year-olds that are in the room now because the young us, the young folks, we need y'all. But I want this thing to go from generation to generation to generation. I want my family to be blessed generation to generation to generation. Can, I wonder, can we all stand? If you're a part of the leadership team of Hope City, I want to invite you to come forward. I want to invite folks who, who, yeah, who are willing to pray for people. Can you guys feel that in the room? Can you feel the peace in the room? The, 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 the sense of blessing? I love these guys up here. So at the marriage conference, we had a moment where we as men kneeled down on one knee and just said, God, help us to be better husbands and fathers and leaders. And we had our wives come up behind us and lay their hands on our shoulders and and pray for us and speak blessing over us. And then we grabbed their hand and prayed for them and spoke blessing over them. And I wonder, as we're talking about family, I wonder if there's some of us in the room who who would say, Q, would you pray for me and my family? That, that the blessing that you're talking about, we would receive it. I believe we receive everything from God. It's given to us by grace, but we receive it by faith. It's our agreement with the truth that releases the reality of it in our life. So here's what I would like to do. If you're here in the room and you think, yeah, I, want, I, want, I want someone to join me in prayer. Pray for me. Pray for my wife. Pray for, pray for me as an individual. Pray for my kids. I want you to come up. Or there may be some of you in the room who go, I, I, haven't, I haven't met Jesus yet. Is there anyone in the room? And you say, you know, I don't, I don't know Jesus yet. But you go, I, I want to start that journey, Q. If it's a daily process and I don't have to be this perfect person and I, I want to start that journey, if that's you, I'm going to ask you to be brave. Raise your hand if that's you. You go, Q, I want to know Jesus more. Yeah. Don't, don't feel any, don't, no one's going to look at you. You're in safe company. Yeah. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Your family. Anyone else? I know the Lord's speaking to some of us today. Yes. Thank you. So we've had two people today join the family. Let's pause and let's clap for that. Yes, Lord. Thank you. (laughs) You're in the family. Yeah. 
you, you, never have to, if you, you never have to do life alone again. If you do, it's only by your choice. We will never turn you away. You're part of our family by God's grace. So let's do this as a family. Let's first pray for those two people who said, I want Jesus. So join me. Everybody pray with me. Jesus, we love you. We need you. We believe today you died for our sins so we could know the Father. Fill us, Lord, with your spirit. Help us live for you. In Jesus' name. Father, I ask you for this spiritual family as we prepare to dismiss. Lord, would you draw them closer to you? Father, I ask that you would help us remember the things you spoke to us today, individual things that we know that spoke to our hearts. Lord, help us to remember those things. Lord, help us as a spiritual family to do family well, to encourage our young children to grow up and to smile at them and to help our women feel like they have a place where they can serve and grow. To help us as men stand as watchmen on the wall to know that we're not disqualified. Lord, use us to bless this city. Lord, we pray again, just this Easter, bring your lost sons and daughters home, Papa. Bring them home. Bring them home. Father, we love you. Help us to love you more. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So so here's what I'm going to ask. In closing, If you are here today and you would like prayer, especially the two of you who raised your hands, I want to, would you allow me to come talk to you? So don't leave. Let me come talk to you, please. Um, The rest of us, come on up and get some prayer. Whatever it is, no things too big, no things too small, let us love on you. Let's love on each other like a family does. If If you're a parent and you got a kid, bring them on in. It's a family celebration. Grab them, bring them in. Come get prayer. God bless you. See you next Sunday, 10 a.m. Amen. See y'all guys next Tuesday.